In the Life is funded in part by Genre Magazine, insightful reading, lifestyle, and fashion for gay men. The H. Van Emmeringen Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, and In the Life members nationwide. New at your Cineplex, gay Asian characters at the movies. Off Broadway gets a gay whoop de doo cushion. And hip hop gets a good rap now that Michelle and Degiacello is out and about. So sit the family down for a new edition of In the Life. Welcome to another episode of In the Life, the only gay and lesbian series you'll find on broadcast television. I'm Greg Watt. And I'm Katherine Linton. In the Life's purpose is to bring discussions of gay culture and identity to a national audience. Not just for gays and lesbians, but for everyone. There are a lot of exciting things happening in the gay community, and In the Life spotlights the voices of artists, filmmakers, musicians, and others who are bringing gay issues out of the closet and into your living room. And out on movie screens. Gay themes are cropping up with greater frequency in the cinema. Perhaps most surprisingly, as Chris Montgomery reports, in a new wave of films with gay Asian characters and themes. Chris? Thanks, Catherine. Up until recently, there were clearly defined roles for Asian characters in films. Men were either seen as kung fu masters or sex-neutral sidekicks, and women were portrayed as dragon ladies or submissive wives. But as the world gets smaller, those stereotypes seem to be falling away. Films like The Joy Luck Club and Heaven and Earth have begun to portray Asian characters in a wider variety of roles. And now with M. Butterfly, Farewell My Concubine, and The Wedding Banquet, those roles have expanded even further to include realistic gay characters as well. I said forget about it. Don't you see? This way Weiwei can stay in the States and paint, and you can finally get your parents off your back. Forget about it. In the wedding banquet, a gay Chinese-American marries a woman to please his parents. We asked for some audience feedback from members of the Asian community. Uh, they pursue the, the uh, themes of being gay to some extent. Uh, you have gay characters, you have them having uh, relationships or falling in love, but you always have a, a uh, capitulation to, uh, to the norms of society I, we, we. Uh, in the end. You, we, Tang. We, we. In terms of the relationship, the Asian American member had a lot of pressures that he was living uh, up to. And these are the same pressures I actually was brought up with. Um, my mother, for example, says, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't care if you're gay or not as long as you get married and have kids. In sickness and in health till death do us part. Till sickness and death. The wedding banquet is more like a, about coming out uh, in the in the Asian community, all the difficulty that it involved, and the story is very universal, um, be, because it could happen in New York, it could happen in Berlin, it could be Asian, could not be Asian. Um, I think that's what it, the film speaks to people. Another Asian film that's gained a crossover audience is Farewell, My Concubine, a film that unfolds in China over 50 years with the Peking Opera as a backdrop. It's the story of one man's lifelong love for another man and his rival who is a courtesan. The film for me, even though it falls into certain formulas, um, manages to transcend it somehow because I think of the level of, of the performances. Based on a true story, M. Butterfly is about a French diplomat who falls in love with a gender-bending diva from the Beijing Opera. Build as a drama of love, deception, and betrayal. It stars Jeremy Irons and John Lone.
You have this film where you have the Western man who's easily fooled and, and who's sort of adult. I mean, I'll, I'll just say that. To me, he was like this adult. I mean, he, he didn't get it, you know. Um, and he's running around with this Madame Butterfly uh, icon in his head. You know, he's pursuing this, this ridiculous, um, to me, stereotype. You made me see the beauty of the story, of her death. It's, it's pure sacrifice. I mean, he's not worthy of it, but what can she do? She loves him so much. It's very beautiful. Well, yes, to a Westerner. Western culture uh, regards Oriental culture as essentially feminine or or if not feminine, then perverse. I, René Gallimard, have known and been loved by the perfect woman. With M. Butterfly and Farewell My Concubine, gayness was coming out in, in, the, in, the, in the theatrical world, meaning the Chinese opera world. So it's almost OK to be gay there. Or, or it's understandable because one of them has to play a female role, so it's not so, not so extraordinary. In that way, I would say Wedding Banquet is probably the most revealing because I don't remember seeing a film uh, where there's a, an Asian and a, a, a Caucasian in a gay relationship. Look, we can move her into the basement room until after the immigration exam, take some photos, take it, send them back to your mom and dad, and perfect. Forget it. Hey. As a married couple, you'll be able to take a big tax break. As an Asian American, I find that things are fairly easy to access. Being brought up here, realizing what, uh, what is available to you, and especially if you're part of a, if you know of a community that's out there, a gay and lesbian community, you can latch on to it, and you can try to get the same things that everyone in that community are fighting for. So, Chris, how have these three films been received? Well, The Wedding Banquet won the Golden Bear Award at the Berlin Film Festival, right. and Farewell My Concubine shared Best Picture honors at this year's Cannes Film Festival, as well as being a big hit with audiences and earning my own personal thumbs up. Mine too. Ironically, M. Butterfly, the one Hollywood big picture, has been a big box office disappointment. Thanks, Chris. M. Butterfly was based on the long-running Tony Award-winning Broadway play, Gay people, of course, have long been the backbone of American theater as writers, directors, performers, and stage technicians. But now gay characters and themes are showing up on stage as well. In fact, as Alan Tulin reports, gay plays are on their way to becoming a staple of the Broadway scene. Thanks, Catherine. This year marks the 25th anniversary of The Boys and the Band, the first major play to deal openly with gay lives. While the play is sometimes criticized for its tortured, self-hating main character, it was groundbreaking for its time. Today, the New York theater is bursting with plays by and about gay people. When I came to New York in the late 50s after graduating from Yale, I, there was no such thing as gay theater. And then um, in 1975, I saw a musical off-Broadway called Lovers, and it was about three gay couples, and I was extremely impressed. About a year later, I started an art center called The Glines. I was one of The Glines to prove that gay play could be commercially viable, which I think we certainly did when we produced Torch Song Trilogy and got it to Broadway and won a Tony and had it played for so many years. And the 1993 Tony Award winners for Best Play and Best Musical both deal specifically with the gay experience. Tony Kushner's Angels in America and Terence McNally's Kiss of the Spider Woman. It seems that gay and lesbian theater has come of age. Now, Howard Crabtree's Whoop-de-Doo 
bills itself as an off-Broadway musical extravaganza. And it's a show that I'm especially fond of. I think you'll see why. All you have to do is look at me. The new recruit is a brute. You can't expect him to shoot. And I a war as well as you or me. It's hard enough to fend off foreign powers. Now we'll have to fend the fruits off in the showers. A fact you cannot dispute. Beware our latest recruit. He's a brute. Senorita. He's a brute. Mark Chiquita. The recruit is a brute. It all kind of started uh, with uh, Philip George, Charlie Katniss, Howard Crabtree, and myself uh, sitting at a little table at Marie's Crisis down in the village talking about the show that we wanted to do. Don't hide from your boots. No, no, no. Say, I hear the woods. One, two, three, it's the One, two, three, two, three. struggled for, um, well, I guess, about a year to put it together uh, and bring it to Off-Broadway. And uh, John Glines came into the project, and together this co-production uh, found its way back to the Actors Playhouse in June of 93. So if it's tough to be a fairy, we'll tough it out and make it through. I think the main reason that the uh, response to the show has been as positive as it's been is because the show is so positive. For the last uh, 10 to 12 years, Gay Theatre has concentrated on the plague times that we live in, and rightfully so. But now we're all pretty much educated and aware of that downside of life. And uh, this show celebrates the upside of life. Some gods are unfree. You guys look like you're having a great time, Alan. So what kind of audiences are you getting? Well, we're getting all kinds of people. In fact, the success of whoop de doo and these other plays is due in large part to their ability to speak simultaneously to a gay and a straight audience. In fact, some of our best reviews have come from the so-called mainstream press. Thanks, Alan. As we see with successful gay-themed plays and movies, it's important to create works that communicate with a greater general audience. With no issue is this fact more apparent than with AIDS. Since the first case was diagnosed in 1981, the toll has been devastating. Nearly 200,000 deaths in the U.S. alone. One of the few bright spots in this tragedy has been the gradual change in perception about people stricken with the disease. Because AIDS in this country was initially seen primarily in gay men, the public, to say nothing of the government and medical establishment, was inclined to ignore the disease as well as its victims. Prejudice fed prejudice, and bigotry against gay people became bigotry against people with AIDS. And new fears of people with AIDS reinforced old fears of gay people. But thanks in large part to the spirited efforts of the gay community, that vicious cycle is now being broken. In the wake of projects like the AIDS quilt, mainstream news organizations are putting more of a human face on the disease and treating gay people and their relationships with a new maturity. One of the finest examples of this new trend was a recent report on ABC's Good Morning America on a member of their own professional family, Steve Kritzik. For the past 10 years, my life has been changed by the threat of a disease that for too many reasons has to be kept secret and whispered about by a society that has such unreasonable fears, so much homophobia and fears of AIDS itself. 
Like so many people stricken by AIDS in their prime, Steve Kritzik had been enjoying a full life in the prospects of a bright future. He had mastered two careers as a talented and respected veterinarian and a TV correspondent here on Good Morning America and other programs. He was so good looking he was able to earn money working as a model while establishing himself as a vet. But Steve's life was not without its trials. For years, Steve struggled with his homosexuality. And then, in the mid-80s, he began to suspect he might be HIV positive. For almost a decade, he felt the need to keep his suspicions a secret. There's always been a fear that people would reject me if they knew the truth. Um, I think that um, I've always been the type of person that's wanted everybody to like me. <laughs> But in the fall of 1992, after volunteering to take care of animals in southern Florida following Hurricane Andrew, Steve's health finally began to fail. And earlier this year, Steve developed his first life-threatening AIDS-related illness. I do think that getting the diagnosis of the lymphoma in my vertebrae and bone marrow and having an, a hematologist oncologist say that even with chemotherapy, and an experimental protocol, the chances are real good that you're not going to survive this and that you could live several weeks or two to three months. That brings you a little closer to facing your own mortality. Steve's immediate family extended beyond his parents and sisters. He also had the unwavering support of his companion of three years, Art Campbell. From the beginning, Art knew where things stood. I told him that first night that I was HIV positive and um, and I think that it amazed me that he didn't just run away <laughs> and uh, and that still almost three years later that he's beside me. And how long does the ganglion block take? Three minutes? Yeah. It's a short procedure. Things that mattered so much before when I was working or before this summer, things that you know would take up all of my time, I realized after a while I could just cut those things out and not even notice they were gone. and. Uh, that you had to really pay attention to the important things. The most important thing this past summer was to help Steve survive an aggressive case of lymphoma and to endure a long and painful course of experimental chemotherapy. Use my hands. Yeah. They hurt, but that's the one that has the pain. Yeah, I understand. There's too many times where I see him in pain or he needs something and there's, there's nothing else I can do and I see a problem and there's, there's nothing I can do to relieve the problem. You want to take off? Uh, no, I'll wait till these guys go up, because I think they're going to go. I love you. I love you, too. It was a close call, but the chemotherapy brought Steve's lymphoma into remission. Of course, no one with AIDS survives with medical care alone. They need people who love and understand them, and they need reasons to go on living. Fortunately, Steve Kritzik has an abundance of both. Brave souls like Steve Kritzik have a dramatic impact on how Americans view gay people and people with AIDS. In fact, viewer response to this segment was overwhelmingly positive. Coming out publicly is a difficult rite of passage for every gay man and lesbian, but sometimes even more so for celebrities and media figures who stand to lose so much professionally. And yet these are the very people best qualified and most needed to serve as role models for future generations of gay people. Last time out, we focused on gay pop music pioneers, musicians such as Holly Near and Sylvester, who came out at a time when being gay was far from the fashion statement it sometimes seems today. But their example has paid off handsomely. Now that a confident new generation of lesbian and gay performers is coming out loud and proud. One such new artist, as Sheridan Bailey reports, is hip-hop's Michelle Ndegio Cello. Thanks, Catherine. Hip-hop. The soulful, funky musical style of today's streets has gotten a bad rap in recent years, largely for the lyrics of some artists which promote violence, sexism, and homophobia. But 24-year-old Michelle Ndegiacello is changing all that. An accomplished artist, she sings, plays guitar, bass, keyboards, and writes her own music. Michelle's debut album, Plantation Lullabies, has won rave reviews. Best of all, she has done something else that no one in hip-hop has ever done. She's come out. 
Uh, prime objective here is just to have a good time, all right? To see Michelle live is to experience the pulsing energy of the music she grew up with, funk, and its DC hybrid known as go-go music. This is hip-hop music, but I'm approaching it from a live standpoint, reminiscent of just, uh, you know, the old soul shows or funk shows that you go to see, and uh, just trying to bring the element of live music back, uh, bringing people out of their homes and getting something that's actually live when they spend $25 or whatever. Just as growing up in the nation's capital helped shape Michelle's sound, so has living in New York affected her writing. In fact, it was her first trip to the Big Apple that influenced her first single, Dreadlock. In D.C. there aren't that many dreads. And I came up here and it was just like a sea of dreads. And uh, I, I just thought it was so beautiful. I mean, the different colors, the different textures, just all the different looks. And it seemed the people who had dreads just had this certain uh, confidence about them that I found very attractive. So I guess it kind of inspired the lyric. Dreads are the natural progression of black hair if you just left it alone. You know, um, it's just a, I guess, actualizing who you are, sort of like, you know, allowing what is to happen to you. So uh, that's, to me, it, it, they're, they're reminiscent of roots. Together we make that from the life, so I love and treat her. For Michelle, being true to her roots also means being true to herself and open about her sexuality. She's never hidden her gayness from her record company or her fans. But she's been criticized by some gay people for not doing more, and in particular, for recording songs that deal with the men who've been in her life. I think it's funny that I wrote this album and they're all sincere lyrics that I have felt or experienced. Don't negate my experiences just because they may not fit in your form. Yes, I am gay or bisexual or whatever. If you ask me, I have no problem. I do not deny that. The album came from a certain time in my life. <laughs> so yes, I have dealt with men. I have a beautiful son. I don't hate men. I, that, that has nothing to do with anything. It's like, uh, <laughs> I just found it very insulting. Um, those songs are, like I said, sincere stories about situations or experiences I've had. That's the bottom line. More than anything, Michelle's message is one of love, love surviving against the odds. Well, the title of the album is Plantation Lullabies. And, uh, Plantation Lullabies. It's a metaphor for, you know, the ghettos, shanty towns, or any place where there is some sort of oppression. Plantation could be your mind, you know. So, and, but they're, they're love songs. It's an album of love songs, you know. That's really great. So what does Michelle's last name, Indegio Cello, mean? It's a Swahili word that means free like a bird. Very appropriate, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yes. Incidentally, Michelle is one of the first artists Madonna signed to her Maverick label. You know, it's great to see Madonna putting her formidable energies behind new gay and lesbian artists. Thanks a lot, Sheridan. And while we're on the subject of lesbians with lung power, uh, Michelle, not Madonna, it's time now for our own Chris Ann Eastwood. In the life's kinder, gentler Andy Rooney. Okay, Chris Ann, what's on your mind? Lesbian chic. Lesbian chic? What is it? Well, when I first heard it, I thought it was some dyke in Saudi Arabia. Then I saw it on the cover of New York Magazine across a picture of K.D. Lang. Is she lesbian chic? I suppose K.D. does not mind being the symbol of lesbian chic, providing it has nothing to do with fur. So what really is this lesbian chic? I guess it means it's chic to be a lesbian, as opposed to dangerous as it has been in the past. So everyone wants to be a lesbian. It's the coolest. Everyone I know who isn't one wants to be one, although the men who want to be lesbians have a harder row to hoe. 
still I think it's admirable. Good luck, guys. It's the straight women, though, that really flip my pancakes. <laughs> they want to be chic, too. I can't tell you how many straight women have come up to me and said, Oh, you know what? You're a lesbian? You know, I had a lesbian experience once when I was in college. It was fantastic. Oh, really, I say. Well, I had a heterosexual experience once when I was in college. Mm. So you know what would really be lesbian chic? Lesbian chic would be lesbian quotas at Fortune 500 companies. Imagine a CEO in the boardroom saying, this company is going down the tubes. We need to hire some lesbians now. Lesbian chic would be the elimination of high heels as the man-made symbol of a woman's femininity. Instead, high heels would be worn only by elected officials to make them walk slow enough so we can catch up to them and demand action. And finally, lesbian chic would be a lesbian hosting a late night talk show, or at least appearing regularly alongside David, Jay, Arsenio, or Conan. Feel free to call me boys. I'm chic now. Lesbian chic. <laughs> lesbian chic. Well, now I feel left out. I mean, is there some way that I could acquire lesbian chic somehow, or just should I settle for that gay je ne sais quoi? Well, you know, Greg, I heard they're going to start selling it in bottle form. Spray action, lesbian chic. You should go pick some up. <laughs> Can't wait. Well, that wraps up another episode of In the Life. Before we go, let's take a look at what's up next time in out. The On the road to the gay games, the largest sporting event in the world. Tragic Hi. divas, high drama and really big hair, gay men and the opera. Hi. And speaking of big hair, we'll tease you with Wigstock 2. So don't miss our next program. Call the 800 number at the end of this program and we'll send you out a guide telling you where to find us every month. Or call just to tell us what you think. In the Life depends on our viewers for support and ideas. Stay with us as we explore the connections between the gay culture and society as a whole. We leave you with a video with another openly gay group signed on to Madonna's Maverick label, Jose and Lewis. So thanks for joining us. And whatever you do, stay tuned, stay healthy, and stay with In the Life. In the Life is funded in part by Genre Magazine, insightful reading, lifestyle, and fashion for gay men. The H. Van Emmeringen Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, and In the Life members nationwide.